As any regular commuter will tell you, foul smells on the London Underground are by no means unknown, despite the best efforts of an army of cleaners. I'm sure we've all had the experience of being stuck next to somebody whose personal hygiene was far from Olympic standard, or that one late-night reveller who, in a very real sense, could not hold their drink. But in the early years of the district line, there was something very fishy going on. That's a sort of pun. What I'm getting at is, they used to transport fish on it, and it was very smelly. London has been a centre of the fish trade for centuries, thanks to its position on the River Thames and relative proximity to the coast. In fact, one of the most consistent legal issues in the Port of London was people setting up fishing nets in the river, versus ships trying to get in and out. There's even an island in Twickenham named Eel Pie Island. Fishing boats came from up and down the river, landing their catch in the city. The Londoners' diet was very fish-heavy. By the 1860s, fried fish, a popular delicacy in the East End of London, had been paired with fried potatoes to create fish and chips. One of the greatest achievements of our national culture, in my personal opinion. I mean, yeah, Magna Carta is pretty good, but it's no fish and chips. The big fish market in London for centuries was Billingsgate, in the heart of the city. In 1982, this moved out to the Isle of Dogs, and there are plans to move it even further out to Barking Reach. The building you're looking at right now was completed in 1877 and was a response to the drastic increase in trade brought about by the railways. You see, with the coming of the railways, fish could be transported from anywhere in the country, often in less than a day, and naturally, a lot of this went to feed the hungry mouths of London. The East Coast fishermen sent a lot of their catch via the Great Eastern Railway. It would be unloaded at Bishopsgate and transported through the city for onward sail. And now, on what might appear to be an unrelated note, we come to the underground. As regular viewers are no doubt tired of hearing me explain, the first underground line was the Metropolitan Railway from Paddington to Farringdon, and this wasn't intended as a purely commuter line as it is today. The Metropolitan Railway made a substantial amount of money from goods traffic, either via their own trains or by letting other companies run trains over their line. They were one of the only rail routes through the City of London, and they connected several of the major terminal stations. The Metropolitan District Railway came along not long after the Metropolitan Railway and said, Me too! Unfortunately, the district wasn't really suited to goods trains. The Metropolitan had built an extra set of tracks to enable other companies to run trains, alongside their own commuter services. Some of these extra tracks now form part of the Thameslink core, and some are abandoned. The district couldn't afford to do the same, nor could they afford to build the kind of goods handling facilities you really need for freight, which, again, the Metropolitan could. Therefore, the freight they carried was limited to what they could put in the guard's van on their passenger trains. Not that this was an inconsiderable source of income. We think of traffic jams as a modern phenomenon, but London in the 19th century was, if anything, worse than it is today. For items that required speed, sticking them on a train was far quicker than braving the gridlocked roads. Parcels, post bags, luggage and newspapers were often sent this way. The district opened parcels offices specifically to make the most of this traffic, and hired porters and bicycle messengers to enable a complete delivery service. But that wasn't all they carried. Monument Station opened in 1884. It wasn't far from Billingsgate, and I'm sure you can see where this is going. Fish, after all, is another very time-sensitive commodity. And in the days before modern refrigeration, even more so. So what would happen is that the fish porters would send boxes on the train for distribution to the fishmongers and restaurants of the capital. As you might imagine, this was a very unpopular form of traffic for staff and passengers alike. It was a very smelly cargo and would often leak, rendering platforms and carriage floors slippery. The smell would get into the wood of the floorboards and the van would have to be scrubbed down. But because the boxes would be sent early in the day, there was rarely time for a proper clean-up before the rush hour, so the poor guard would just have to put up with the smell for the rest of the day. This cargo service did not last long, and the fish porters were told, politely I hope, to find alternative means of transportation. 
No doubt the company envied the Metropolitan Railway, who had a great deal of success thanks to their access to the far less noisome meat traffic from Smithfield Market. But it seemed that for the district, market traffic on that kind of scale would remain the impossible bream. Well, I hope you enjoyed this stinky tale from the tube. If you did, please do click the like button and consider subscribing for more. Personally, I think the district missed a trick. They could have hired their tunnels out as smokehouses. But hindsight is 2020, as they say. Thanks as ever to my donors on Kofi and Patreon. You are the ice to my dead fish. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.